Hello and welcome to Unstitches. In the previous video on the Faf Tipmatic uh, children's sewing machine, you might have seen me uh, show this little machine as a quick demonstration on how the stitch length works. And I thought that I would do a video showing how to unseize a machine and how to track down where the machine's seized and go ahead and um, you know rectify the issue. Now it's not going to be a full restoration video or anything like that. Uh, there's plenty of other videos on YouTube that show you how to you know, fully restore these, how to use them. Um, this is not going to be one of those videos. The only other thing I can see that's wrong with this machine is the, the there's a problem with the tensioner here. So once we get it uh, freed up, uh, we'll work on the tensioner. As you can see, it's a, it's a little bit rusty and whatnot. You know that that can be cleaned up this is a customer's machine i don't know whether she wants me to go uh you know and spend a, a lot of time cleaning all this up or whether she just wants to get it going at this stage but i'll check that out with her and at this stage i'll get the machine up and running we can see that it's completely locked up if i try and turn the hand wheel here just a very slight movement in the hand wheel but nothing else so we'll have a wee go at tracking down where it's seized. The key to finding out where a seizure is in a machine is to look for parts that still move. Now I'll show you that in more detail in a second. Um, but you know on a machine like this here you, you could just arbitrarily uh, you know spray a lubricant onto you know like a penetrating oil onto all of the points that you think might be seized up the main points to look at would be this shaft here coming through this bearing and that bearing so that would be probably prime candidates uh, this here where the hand wheel turns on the shaft here and if we have a look up here this is the needle bar drive here there's a linkage here um, this bar comes across, you know, could be seized there, I, I doubt it. Um, and the other thing is to look at the uh, needle bar. That's quite a common seizure place as well, especially if the machines have been sitting for a long time. And um, I can see there that the, the foot bar is not seized. So, you know, I would start by just oiling that. Anything that I can see is moving, I'll just oil as I normally would, just around the shaft there. That's looking good there. Little foot lifter. All metal parts in this machine, unlike the little faff, which unfortunately, if you've seen the video, uh, couldn't get it to work. Uh, if you want to have a look at that, just take a look at my previous video. The faff uh, toy machine there. So what you can do is you can have a wee look to see whether that needle bar is seized or not. And it can be a little bit difficult sometimes to uh, see this, but if you give the needle bar a little bit of a wiggle, I can feel this, but it's, you know, it's probably going to be difficult to see on camera. You might be able to see that oil there. Right at this point here, you can see that oil is actually moving there. So I can feel that needle bar moving. So that gives you an indication that this top needle bar bearing's not seized. I can feel movement there as well. If we give it a little bit of a twist, I can actually see the needle bar twisting just slightly. Might be difficult to see on the camera, but I can feel it and I can see it. I can see this piece here just turning very slightly. And that says to me this needle bar is free. Okay, so this is uh, one of the main spots here eliminated. It could be this linkage here. Give that a wiggle there. I can feel that moving there. Now the machine's moving a little bit, but this bar here is also moving. So that's free also. So we're gradually narrowing this down. I'll just get a bit of oil in there. Okay, and you know you can see that linkage here that's reasonably free. So next thing to take a look at is the hand wheel. Now if I try and turn it back and forward 
you might be able to see that there, a slight amount of movement there. So that would indicate to me too that the hand wheel here is free as well. We'll get a little bit on this point here, hopefully some of that oil will soak into that bearing there. So that only leaves one part. This is a fairly simple machine, so you know it's quite a good place to start uh, to show you how to unseize a machine. So that really only leaves one thing. Now the reason that this hand wheel can move slightly is because these gears here, this gear where it meshes down here, will have a slight amount of play in it. If I move that, you can see that there's a little bit of backlash in those gears there, that's fine. Uh, but because I can move the hand wheel, so you can see there that this gear here on the shaft is not budging. So that pretty much proves really that it's probably uh, this bearing here uh, and or this bearing here on this lower shaft. So we need to free that up. So I'm, I'm using CRC556 here. Okay, you could use WD40 or other penetrating oils. And I would just give that a little bit of a squirt down onto that side of the bearing and maybe and maybe on this side here as well. And also in here, either side of that bearing there. It doesn't need much, just a small spray there. So you could leave that to soak in. Um, but if you're impatient or you just need to get the job done, you could try working at it. Let's see whether it'll free up. I don't want to force it too much because you know you could if you force this too much it's potentially a damage uh, you know the gears here put strain on something. So I'm just going to gradually work away at it. You can actually see it starting to move. I'll get you in closer there. You can see it starting to move there. Hopefully work a little bit of that penetrating oil in there. You can see a little bit of play in the shaft just where my tip of my thumb is there. You can see a little bit, bit of the mo uh, movement there, lubricant moving around. Now there could be another bearing that's seized here too. That's this where this linkage joins onto this gear here. I'll just get some oil onto that because Probably less likely to be that, but get some oil on there. There we go. It's starting to free up nicely there now. So that's the penetrating oil working its way in there. Now the purpose of penetrating oil is that it's finer and it uh, gets into all the nooks and crannies that standard oil might take a very long time to get into. So that's, that's freed up nicely there. And you're best off just uh, cleaning off as much of the penetrating oil as possible once it's freed up. And uh, getting some standard oil on there. It's because you don't really want the machine running with uh, penetrating oil in there because it's too light. You need the sewing machine oil to you know sort of replace the penetrating oil as such there. Just douse that with a bit of oil. You can't really go too far wrong with over oiling one of these. There's no electrics to worry about. You could dunk that whole machine in a uh, bath of oil it wouldn't worry it. The maker. This oil bath is going to feel so good. Yep, that's seems to be working fine there. That's turning over nicely. These are a nice smooth little machine actually. Now I'm going to get this machine up and running. Uh, problem is I don't have the correct needles for it. 
they are a special needle, the 24 by 1 needle, and I don't have any, and uh, I know my suppliers don't have any either. I buy needles for all sorts of different machines, and um, uh, the 24 by 1 needle is one that my suppliers don't have, so uh, I have to order them from an overseas company, and uh, I'm too impatient really to wait for them to arrive so uh, apparently you can cut down a standard 15 by 1 needle I'll put the standard needle in here and we'll be able to tell just by where the hook comes through on the needle as to how much I need to uh, trim off there so yeah that'll be the plan hopefully it'll work just get this um, feed bar oiled here make sure it turns or turn the right direction I can also show you once I get this up and running how a chain stitch works we can see the underside of the feed dog here that's the feed dog here you can see the mechanism it's just driven on a cam here pretty simple but effective and nice and smooth I mean compared to that faff uh, toy which is, wasn't a, it wasn't made by FAF, it was made by a Hong Kong company. Uh, nothing against FAF at the time, it was just a toy. Uh, but yeah, geez, it, even, you know, I mean, uh, it, it sounded like a coffee maker grinder. <laughs> if, you, if you've had a look at the video. Uh, but that's probably because the plastic gears are broken. Uh, so we can't really blame it for that. But yeah, it reminded me of a co coffee grinder. Yeah, but this is beautiful and smooth. Really nice. It's not the best one I've seen, but um, my customer, she's uh, in her 70s, I would say, and she was given it when she was three. So, yeah, uh, just shows you, you know, how well they were made and um, still going strong, I would say, hopefully. Let's get a needle in there and put a standard universal. Uh, 130-705H or you know otherwise known as a 15X1 needle it's going to be too long I'm pretty sure but let's have a wee look uh, what's what way does it go it goes with the flat facing the inside there I'm not even sure this will allow me to turn the machine over you can see there the needle's not coming right out. That's at its highest position there. So let's have a wee look down here. Turn in operating direction. Needle comes down. I think it's going to snap. Uh, so I'm just going to turn it in reverse here. Just to get an idea of how much I need to take off. Yeah, so I need to take a heap off. I mean that um, point of this little looper here should be just above the needle eye really about a you know say a millimeter or so above the needle eye and if we measure that so I'm just sort of judging this really I'll take off that much to start with what's that five millimeters I think that should still work if I'd grind five millimeters off this shank the standard needle I think we should be Pretty close so I'll go away and get that done and uh, back in a second to try it out well I thought my plan was going to be a little bit of a fail actually because I I cut down the needle here so I've just cut the uh, top of the shank off there just ground that back the problem is when I install this needle it goes quite a way up into the hole there let's make sure I've got it around Correctly, like that, you'll see when I tighten the screw there that the needle kind of angles to the left. It's not vertical completely, you can see it's got an angle on it. And I have to push the needle over to get it down through the uh, throat plate hole there. So that didn't quite work out. The reason it's doing that is because the needle goes quite a way up into the, into the needle bar here 
and this screw is tightening uh, because I've modified the needle it's not the one it's designed for the screw is tightening up there and it's pushing the needle uh, because this is a slanted surface here it's pushing the needle kinking it like that I had to put my thinking cap on as to how to deal with it and I thought well why not try a shorter needle as you can see I've got quite a uh, stock of needles different needles industrial I mean there's all the um, universals down here different types of universals they're all similar lengths you know the same length actually um, but I've got a lot of industrial needles here for all sorts of different types of machines and there's heaps of different industrial needles and I thought well maybe I should try a an overlocker needle they're generally fairly short and um, the first one I thought about was a BLX1 that's for a baby lock um, but they're actually quite long if you compare it with a standard universal they are about the same length so that was not going to work but what I did find was a DCX1 here these are quite short if I put a standard universal in the carrier you can see there that the DCX1 needles are quite a bit shorter so that's exactly what I was looking for the only thing I was worried about was the uh, shank size the diameter I, and at first glance I thought it wasn't going to fit in the uh, needle bar but anyway it did and um, if I just take this one here out and we'll put this one here in fits perfectly in the needle bar it's a round shank so you do have to be careful of the orientation of the needle so the scarf um, you see the scarf lines up with the flat so the flat here on the needle lines up with the scarf here it's pretty hard to see get, try and get you in closer there there's a little cut out just above the eye of the needle called the scarf there not sure if you can see it there let's see if I can get you closer there we go it's about as close as I can get that cut out just above the eye of the needle there that's called the scarf and on a standard universal it lines up with the flat so normally you'd put the flat facing towards the inner of the machine and that way the scarf is also facing the inside of the machine but with the uh, standard round shank here you just have to make sure the scarf lines up with the inside arm so it faces the scarfs on this surface here and that actually works really well okay and if we have a look underneath here we'll see that needle comes down the problem with the longer needle is also it hits this here so we've got good clearance there and we've got a little bit of needle bar rise and then the hook comes through picks up the thread off the needle which I haven't got it threaded obviously but I'll show you that in a second and then it comes around and forms a loop for the needle to come back down and then goes through its motions again and you can see there that it's clearing nicely there and the loop is coming in just above the needle eye which is pretty much what we want there have a close look there I mean the needle could be a little bit shorter so the critical distance is the distance between the needle eye uh, generally the top of the needle eye and the looper there the tip of the looper or the lower surface of the looper there it could be coming a little bit high but I think it's going to catch the loop we'll soon find out when we thread it up and uh, give it a go there so there's a wee tip if you're short of uh, 24x1 needles uh, DCX1 or 81X1 needle otherwise known as an 82X1 or a DMX1 uh, or can you <laughs> or um, you know that's the size yeah good alternative I was absolutely blown away when I first started my apprenticeship at how many needles there were available for sewing machines and I've got a book here that shows you uh, this is 1951 I think this book 
and um, you know with your standard domestic machines you've got a universal what they call a universal needle which is you know this here the one the 130 slash 705 H there standard universal fits most domestic sewing machines but industrials are very different and uh, here's an example of all the different needles I mean this book shows you it's got lists and lists there's all the needles here and if you run across that's your specifications here and there are literally oh, thousands and thousands and thousands of different types of needle that really blew me away when I first started my apprenticeship back in uh, 1986 somewhere around there um, 87 yeah just heaps and heaps of needles uh, all different point sizes different lengths different shank sizes uh, different uh, blade sizes you know different size of eye things like that and you can see uh, they talk a little bit here about a new numbering system uh, this will be the, the NM the metric uh, measurement system so size 90 needle is 0.9 times 100 so it's yeah 0.9 of a millimeter a 110 is 1.1 mil and it cleared up a lot of confusion between different brands I mean here's you've you've got your uh, different types of needles Faf Singer System Union Wheeler Wilson System 287 you know Wilcox and Gibb big list of different uh, makers Reese um, Lewis Columbia some of the ones that I know Mauser you know there's there's quite a lot involved in needles actually more than meets the eye so yeah that nice uh, 90, book from 1951 there okay back to the machine here now when this here we've got a problem with the tensioner here when this comes up here it should push on this here to release the tension and you can see that it looks like it's bent up something's not quite right there and apparently there's a spring steel so it might not bend that easily I'm not quite sure why that's bent so far yeah I'm not sure if I'll be able to bend that back again I've just um, off camera bent this here straight and I've bent this down a little bit as well because this is not sitting on this little post when I tighten the mounting screw this isn't sitting here on the little post here I think that should sit down on the post and it's not doing that and also this little spring was bent as well I've just straightened that back out again uh, I'd be careful about straightening that one that's probably spring steel and um, needs a good clean as well as I say I, you know I'm not going to go too far into the cleaning process in this video uh, if the customer wants me to I'll go ahead and do it uh, but there's plenty of good videos on YouTube actually on these machines and one of them I saw was uh, how to clean these up to make them look like brand new again um, and also other good videos on how to use these machines so you know if you want a little bit more detail on that side of things there's uh, plenty of good videos on YouTube that will sit on the post it is if I tighten that up still sitting on the post and this here this bar should come up and release the this tension here and it's not really if that needs bending down just slightly yeah still not not releasing there not sure if I'll get any more yeah I might be I might just see if I can get a little bit more out of this just to see if I can bend it down just a fraction more it's got a little bit more to go uh, bent it down quite a bit there uh, not not quite going to release there so it just it releases tension right at the top of its stroke is how it should work
see it lifting there, lifts the tension off that spring there. So the thread passes down through this hole, comes out the other side here, and every stitch it releases at that point, top of the needle bar stroke. And that means it's just relying on this tensioner here only. Okay, I think that's probably good enough to thread up and try out there now. Let's do that. We've got a numbered system here. One, two, there's a three stamped on there, believe it or not. Four, uh, there's a five there, you might be able to make out just there, five. A spool here, it's a bit big. <laughs> just a little cone of scan fill here. Dwarfs the little machine, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, thread through here. And then down through this one over the tensioner. Is it over? Yep. Ah, oh, yeah, there's six there. Six threading point four there. Up through five. Through six. And then seven down through the needle. Feels okay. Using a size 70 needle here. Okay, and we should be set to go. Let's get a little bit of test fabric here and make sure we rotate in operating direction. Follow the arrows here and we should be set to go. Oop. Something's tight. Is that not releasing? I don't think this is releasing properly. It might be a bit tight there somehow. Yeah, something's not right. That's probably more than likely a tension issue. I'll come back when I get this sorted. I'll let you know what I find. Oh, that was easy. <laughs> I uh, just loosened this tension here. That was too tight. And it seems to be working there now. Well, I've done three stitches. Gee, it's quiet. I think that has to be the quietest machine I've ever heard. And will it chain? No, it's not going to chain for me. If I had it clamped to the desk, I could um, hold the fabric, pull the chain, and it probably would chain out, but I haven't got a clamp for it at the moment. Yeah. A little bit hard to see there probably. There we go. Doing not a bad little chain there. It's on top. Looks good. Does a nice job. I'm impressed. Let's get another piece of fabric and I'll show you how this chain action works. Needle coming down. I've done one stitch already. So you'll see there's two things happening here. Uh, let's concentrate on the uh, looper here, picking up the thread off the needle here. Don't worry about this too much at the moment, but that is part of the process. So it picks up the needle thread, comes around. You'll see that it's got the loop there. And coming around, it's spreading the loop, right, for the needle to come back down through it. And then as that's happening, the loop is coming around again to pick up the next stitch. And that forms your chain stitch. You can see the old stitch there being pulled up. And the new stitch is being formed. Just like that. Clever, eh? No need for a bobbin. <laughs> Yeah, the only uh, disadvantage to this is the uh, stitch can unravel quite easily. So this is the type of stitch that you'll find 
on a, uh, you know, like a sack of potatoes or if you buy charcoal in a bag or something like that where it's been closed by a bag closing machine. It's a similar process. The bag closers, they use a oscillating looper, a little bit more like the, the little faff toy that I showed you in the last video. They use a, a looper like that that oscillates back and forward. But it's the same sort of principle. And that's it. Oh, backwards. Whoops, I just jammed it. <laughs> Turns the opposite direction to a standard machine. <laughs> oh, we'll start again there. Operating direction. And definitely wins the prize for the quietest sewing machine ever. So that's it for this one. We have a successful repair of the little Singer Model 20 here. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, I certainly did enjoy uh, resurrecting the machine. As I say, it's not perfect. I'll go and uh, clean it up if need be, but I suspect the customer will just want it back with its patina, maybe. Um, I'll check with her, but that's it for this one. Keep an eye out uh, for more videos, and thank you very much for watching, and thank you very much to my patrons on Patreon.